Welcome to a follow-up episode to the Dongfang Hour Weekly Space News Roundup. There was just so much news in the past week that we decided to make two episodes. And so this is the follow-up episode to the traditional Sunday episode that was released a couple of days ago. So this week, we discussed the funding from a Chinese rocket propulsion subsystem manufacturer called Interspace Explorer. We discussed the city of Guangzhou adding satellite internet to their 14th five-year plan policy. But first, let's discuss the very eye-catching project of Caspace, who apparently is building a competitor to Blue Origin's New Shepard. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. So, Caspace and space tourism. Caspace is a commercial company that's backed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and with the support of the Guangzhou government. And they announced this week an agreement with another company called Zhuhai Orbita to develop a rocket that looks conceptually very similar to the New Shepard and that will be used for space tourism. This is significant news because currently there is really a big lack of any space tourism projects in China, although there were some companies like iSpace or LandSpace, all Chinese companies that had to some extent some PowerPoint space tourism projects. And there was also space transportation that we mentioned in the previous episode, which is a launch startup that focuses on space planes and hypersonic transportation and that also had a space tourism project. But enough of those companies, let's focus on Caspace's spacecraft, and there's a fair bit to unpack. Let's start with the booster rocket. So unsurprisingly for a suborbital launch, the rocket adopts a single stage architecture with a stage diameter of 3.35 meters. And the rocket is powered by five sets of 15 tons thrust liquid fueled Carolox engines called Xuan Yuan, which is still under development at the very moment by a fellow CAS, so Chinese Academy of Sciences, commercial spinoff called XAPT, XAPT standing for Xi'an Aerospace Propulsion Technology. The Xuanyun engine was designed from the start for reusability with the ability to throttle and to restart the engine multiple times. And this enables the first stage to be recovered for the cast space space tourism spacecraft, similar to Blue Origin's New Shepard. Together, the five engines provide a liftoff thrust of um, 75 tons. And this is enough to lift off the rocket, which will have a liftoff weight of about 70 tons. Next, let's talk about the crude capsule. The top of the rocket hosts a capsule, also with a diameter of 3.35 meters, a height of three meters, and four panoramic windows. The cabin is designed for seven passengers, basically a, a passenger capacity that's very close to Blue Origin's New Shepard, which is around six, I would believe. Let's talk now more about the similarities and the differences between New Shepard and the Cast Space project. To a large extent, they're very similar. They, you know, they adopt a similar single booster rocket architecture. Both capsules look quite similar and both return to Earth thanks to three parachutes, or at least for Cast Space, this is what I get when I look at the illustrations that were provided by Cast Space. Um, similar to the New Shepard capsule, the Cast Space capsule is also equipped with an escape system, so very likely also solid rocket motors. Um, we know that Caspace is also aiming for a flight time of 10 minutes, and this is very close to the 11 minutes that's promised by Blue Origin's New Shepard on their corporate website. Um, so that's for the similarities. Now, there are some differences despite the, you know, the, the very similar looks that these two systems and spacecraft have. I think the main differences lie in three areas, as far as I can tell. The first one is that New Shepard uses a single in-house developed BE3 Hydrolox engine that uses a tap-off cycle, while Cast Space's version uses the five Xuan Yuan Carolox engines that use an open generator cycle. Probably the second difference, and in my opinion, the biggest difference is their uh, technical solutions regarding aerodynamic control. The New Shepard booster uses aft fins at the bottom that tilt and that are used up to Mach 4. And there are also wedge fins for stability at the top. There's a ring fin in order to enhance stability by moving the center of pressure towards the top during the descent. And finally, there are also drag brakes to lower the speed during descent. And this is similar to drag brakes that you could have on a plane. And finally, the BE3 engine provides additional control by performing gimbaling. I think on the Caspace side, probably Caspace's spacecraft, and I mean, 
rocket booster will also rely on gimbaling. But regarding the aerodynamic surfaces, it seems that based on the illustrations that were provided, that they would rely rather on grid fins rather than the various solutions that are used by Blue Origins, um, New Shepard mentioned a couple of seconds ago. And I think the last difference, also a significant dif difference, is the way that they perform vertical landing. And so for both rockets, it's performed retropropulsively. But for New Shepard, the, the booster rocket uses landing legs to land, whereas CASPACE's system seems to be caught in midair by a launch tower. And this is quite similar to SpaceX's concept for their Super Heavy. So those are the three big differences. Uh, to be honest, I think there's a lot of assumptions here because what I'm what I'm saying here from Cast Space, a lot of it is based on uh, you know illustrations that were provided on a WeChat post, and I'm not sure that the designer of these illustrations were really basing their designs on engineering work that were um, put together by the engineering teams of Cast Space. But you know, it's it's still a good indication. I think we'll probably have to wait uh, until the first flight of Cast Space next year to get a feel of the real, the final technical choices. Now, regarding the roadmap, um, CASPACE plans a first demonstration flight in 2022. Uh, this will be followed by a full-fledged unmanned suborbital flight in 2023, and CASPACE plans to start their, um, well, their, you know, their suborbital space tourism business in 2024. The company estimates that there's a thousand passengers that can be transported into space every year. Now, that's probably uh, a global market perspective rather than specifically cast space. Now, I want to add one fun fact on cast space. It's the fact that the liftoff and landing site for this rocket will be constructed within an aerospace themed park, a space experience hall, and an aerospace science education base. So the principle here is that passengers will receive a short training before the 10-minute flight that will traverse the Kármán line that will enable passengers to experience 10 minutes uh, three minutes, sorry, of weightlessness and enable them to be, you know, called astronauts. Um, last point also on this piece of news, um, which is probably the odd part of this piece of news, it's the Jew high angle of all of this. And remember at the beginning, I mentioned that this suborbital tourism project was announced within the context of CAS space in Zhu high orbita, signing a cooperation agreement to promote the presumably CAS led or suborbital spacecraft project, but also the Zhu high orbita led Juhai-1 constellation. So what is Juhai Orbita? Juhai Orbita is an Earth observation satellite operator and data analytics company. Uh, they're operating the Juhai-1 series of video hyperspectral and optical satellites, of which there are currently 12 in orbit. And Caspace and Juhai Orbita have agreed to carry out joint rocket and satellite designs, joint operations and launch, and joint completion of the Juhai-1 um, constellation, which eventually plans to have 34 satellites into orbit. Now, it's a bit of a weird association. It's not clear what the synergies here would be, but um, and it's not clear what each company would you know, bring on the table here. But I think it's a great example of a development of Guangdong province space cluster with Zhuhai, uh, Zhuhai Orbita basically being based in Zhuhai City and Zhuhai being basically, what, one, one and a half hour drive to the south of Guangzhou and Guangzhou being also where to a large extent cast space is based. So um, maybe to wrap this up, I, I want to say that I'm a, bit, a little bit surprised to see this development in China, especially now, even if there's a market like cast space says of a thousand passengers per year interested in suborbital space tourism. Honestly, traveling to space is still a very um, ostentatious display of wealth in the current context of China, uh, with a lot of the rich tending to lie low. Um, it is it is surprising that um, you know, they are so bullish on this market. But, you know, it's still a pretty cool development. They're still very early stage, so we'll have to see uh, where all of this goes. But, um, Blaine, do you want to tell us maybe um, what's going on also with some unprecedented stuff regarding commercial cargo spacecraft this time? Definitely. And I would first point out that I did look it up on Baidu Maps. It is a one hour and five minute drive from Drew High Orbiter's office to Cass Space Office. So one hour, five minutes, quite close. <laughs> So getting into the um, commercial cargo spacecraft. So this week on August 4th, Beijing-based startup Interspace Explorer, or Beijing Xinji Kaifa, raised tens of millions of RMB in an angel round of funding, with the sole investor being the InnoAngel Fund. The investment will be used to expand the team and fund research and developments, this according to the company founder, Fu Shiming. Quite a lot to unpack here with this very exciting piece of news. So Interspace Explorer was founded in 2018, and the company is in the business of building reusable cargo spacecraft. The company founder Fu notes that as China is building out its space station capabilities, 
One critical area is going to be the ability to bring cargo back to Earth from the space station, something that the current Tianzhou vessels cannot do, and that no other Chinese commercial company has seriously attempted. According to Fu, this is what Innerspace hopes to accomplish. Innerspace is designing a prototype reusable cargo spacecraft, namely the Zhengzhang-1, with a carrying mass to the space station of 350 kilograms and a return carrying mass of not less than 100 kilograms. So not a huge cargo craft to be sure, but you could certainly do a lot with 100 kilograms <clears throat> given how ridiculously weight efficient everything must be in order to go up to the Chinese space station to begin with. The company began R&D on the Zhengzhang-1 in January of this year, which times up very well with a tender that I'm going to discuss momentarily. Requirements for the downward missions for the CSS are expected to be five to 10 per year, starting from the space station's completion next year, 2022. The Zhengzhang-1 is planned for a test flight in 2022, and the company notes that they already have prospective customers lined up in industries such as pharmaceuticals and space agriculture. The next steps for interspace will include various environmental tests of the spacecraft prototype, as well as separation testing, wind tunnel testing, etc. At the time of the funding round, Interspace also announced an agreement with Galactic Energy for launch services, and this being one of the more interesting elements of this announcement. This is a pretty significant win for one of the relative latecomers to China's very crowded commercial launch sector, but also a very fast catcher-upper, you know, making up words now, um, Galactic Energy. So Galactic Energy was founded as, uh, as late as 2018. And it's an interesting validation of the business case for the Chinese commercial launch uh, sector, although there are still a very large number of launch vehicles being developed. Uh, noteworthily, the agreement with Galactic Energy is apparently deeper than just launch, with plans for the companies to coordinate on product development, personnel exchanges, technical exchanges, and company operations. So definitely a pretty interesting collaboration, it seems, between Interspace Explorer and Galactic Energy. So a little bit more on Interspace Explorer's founding team. So again, the founder, Fu, was a member of the CASC teams that built the Tiangong-2 space station and has also worked on the human space flight and Chang'e programs. One of the company's directors, Mu Yuqiang, appears to be an expert in automation, having studied at the Nanjing University of Science and Technology. And overall, it's a pretty interesting founding team. The timing of the announcement is interesting, with the announcement earlier this year having seemingly paved the way for such a business to make sense. So as we discussed on the Dongfang Hour episode 15 back in January, we saw an RFP for a low-cost spacecraft from the CMS, the China Manned Space, China Manned Space, yeah, should be. Engineering Bureau, I think. China, uh, CMSEO, yeah, so China Manned Space Engineering Office, yeah. Um, so as noted at the time, this was an unprecedented move. So human space flight, uh, so as we noted at the time back in January, this is an unprecedented move with human space flight in China having up to that point and still now being pretty much 100% run by the so-called national team and has generally been pretty hush-hush in terms of procurement. So, so to see an open tender like we saw back in January was very surprising. The tender was released as China is assembling the Chinese space station of which the core module, the Tianhe, was launched back in April and the first Shenzhou crewed mission was in June and with plans for the Mengtian and Wentian lab modules set to launch next year. And so the tender that was issued back in January seems to align very well with the Zhengzhang one uh, with the Zhengzhang one capsule in that the tender specified requirement to return 100 to 200 kilograms of cargo to Earth. And just a reminder, Zhengzhang one is more than 100 kilograms. And the low cost requirement is certainly something that most Chinese commercial companies are familiar with. We do note, however, that the previous tender from January had to be submitted by February 2021. So while Interspace will likely bid for future tenders, it will certainly not be winning the one issued earlier this year. So just a couple of notes on the financiers here, which is also an interesting thing to unpack. Uh, so this is not you know, Angel Fund's first investment into the space sector, with the fund having participated in two funding rounds of launch startup Tianbing Aerospace, a funding round for satellite component manufacturer Sysdata, and a very early uh, 2016 funding round into Spacey. And the company is sort of a medium-sized fund with total investments of around 4 billion RMB and with a, with a focus on various emerging technologies. And so just a note about InnoAngel Fund's partner, Zhu Shaocheng. Uh, so he's one of the directors of Interspace Explore. And Zhu has apparently been involved in the space sector in China for a little while, noting in an interview from last month that he met with Space City founder Yang Feng and co-founder Ren Weijia 
as early as 2016 to understand the company's business and China's rapidly evolving space sector more generally. And according to Zhu, the meeting was on a Sunday. So apparently the man has either an excellent memory, a very accurate calendar that he can make uh, reference to, or otherwise the meeting must have made a hell of an impression. Uh, so the interview, which is definitely worth reading in full, also describes Zhu meeting with Tianming Aerospace co-founder Kang Yonglai, who apparently told Zhu that he wants to be the Chinese Elon Musk. And apparently Zhu replied saying, quote, many people say this, I usually feel they are empty words, but after chatting with him, I thought it was quite good. So apparently Zhu is not only quite bullish on the Chinese commercial space sector, but also on, uh, on Tianming Aerospace. And this may be an indication that this is not the last space-related investment that we will see from Inno Angel Fund. Uh, so, Sean, anything on your side from the um, from this this uh, this capsule, or shall we move on to the Guangzhou announcement? Let's hear about Guangzhou and, and satellite internet. Absolutely, I'm a big fan of Guangzhou. Uh, so, this, this week, the city of Guangzhou added satellite internet to its 14th five-year plan. So just a reminder, Guangzhou is one of China's largest and wealthiest cities and is in the very developed province of Guangdong. We've talked about Guangdong's rising space sector on several previous episodes, so I will keep this relatively short. But this news is significant in that it represents the latest space industry development in Guangdong province. In the last few months, we have now seen both Guangzhou and Shenzhen, two very large cities about 45 minutes apart by high-speed train, add satellite internet to their development plans. And uh, just to unpack this a little bit, these are not just uh, two, these are not any two cities in China. So just a couple of brief statistics about Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Uh, they have a combined population of 35 million people, which is comparable to Canada, a combined nominal GDP of 800 billion US dollars, which is comparable to Switzerland, larger than Turkey, and if they were a country, would be the 17th largest GDP of any country in the world. And they have a GDP per capita of about 27,000 US dollars, which is to say pretty wealthy cities. And so this budding space sector in Guangdong is not only budding very fast, but it is doing so with significant support from two of China's biggest megacities. And so we need to look no further, in fact, than the news discussed earlier in this episode of Caspace and Zhuhai Orbita, both of which are headquartered in Guangdong, with Caspace and in Guangzhou and Zhuhai Orbita in Zhuhai. In the case of Guangzhou this week, the linked article highlights three major projects, all of which have been covered on previous Dongfang Hour episodes. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check them out. The three projects are a Caspace rocket industrial base, which is being built in Nansha district of Guangzhou, and with plans for both solid and liquid fueled rockets. There is a Gili uh, Gi Space uh, headquarters that is also in Nansha, and this is the automotive company setting up their, their space operations there. And finally, there is a TCL space component subsidiary, Moshing Semiconductors, uh, with technology giant having created a space focused semiconductor and component manufacturing company near the heart of urban Guangzhou. And so again, we had covered all three of those earlier this year. And if you're interested in more information, I encourage you to check them out. And so just to round out the week, a couple of fun factoids about Guangzhou. Uh, so the city is at the heart of the Greater Bay Area, which is one of the three major megalopolises being developed by China, the other two being Jingjinji and the Yangtze River Delta. As a trading hub for several thousand years, Guangzhou is a relatively international city and has historically been home to a large African and Middle Eastern community, particularly concentrated around the Xiaobei area, uh, which I guess I would have last gone to in about 2016. Uh, so a good article from Reuters that will link about the community struggles post-COVID, and also a China and Africa podcast episode about a controversial campaign in April of last year by the Guangzhou government to forcibly test Africans for COVID and quarantine them. So again, very international city, a lot of interesting things going on. Uh, finally, there's kind of a, a fun fact. So Guangzhou is uh, perhaps most well, uh, most famous for being home to one of the widest varieties of food on earth. And I recall in 2011, walking down a street in Guangzhou with my brother and seeing a street vendor with a wooden stand on which there were hanging some dead snakes and other reptiles. And my brother at that time had been in China for about two days and was pretty taken aback. Um, and so in addition to the usual suspect of dim sum, Cantonese uh, people for whom Guangzhou is the cultural and commercial center are known to eat just about anything. And uh, just to get our Prince Philip quote for the day in, uh, Prince Philip did once say, if it has got four legs and is not a chair, if it has two wings and it flies, but is not an airplane, and if it swims and is not a submarine, the Cantonese will eat it. And uh, politically incorrect as that may be, Prince Philip said it, not me. So on that happy note, this has been another two-part episode of the Dongfang Hour. 
And if you've made it this far, you must either really love Chinese space or really love hearing our voices. So do feel free to take a moment to like or comment or share with friends. I'm Blaine Curzio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. And this has been a two-part Dongfang Hour Space News Roundup for the 9th to 15th of August, 2021. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for watching and see you next week. Bye.